You may be seated. Good morning, everybody. Good to be with you this morning. I'm going to turn your attention now to the Gospel of John as we continue to go through this rich gospel, the biography of Jesus as told by one of his best friends, the one he calls Beloved. Today we are in a chapter that is well known um, and yet is still a challenge for all those who seek to live into its example. And so I'm going to pray and then I'll read the text. Lord Jesus, we ask that as we read your word, that you would be in our midst to lead, to guide. Jesus, you are Lord, King, Savior, and you are also the one who serves, who comes to serve us, to bless us, to give us all that is good. And so I pray that as we read these words, that we would pay attention to your example and help us to listen and to obey. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. John chapter 13, starting at verse 1, says this. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Uh, As you could imagine, being named Peter, I'm always kind of impressed by Peter in the gospel and the ways that he continues to make mistakes that open up a conversation about a deeper truth that reminds us something that we need to know. That Jesus uh, takes the occasion for Peter's foolishness, his impulsiveness, his, uh, his just wrong-headedness uh, to bless us with this incredible teaching and truth. And we kind of have to ask ourselves the question, if he wasn't there to make the mistake, would we have been able to learn what we were there to learn? I was... Uh, with a group uh, uh, of colleagues, all pastors in the room, and we were having a conversation around, how do you know the difference between when you are thinking something and feeling something and when God is telling you something, right? And we've all run into people 
that seem to not be able to make that distinction very well. People that would say, in the name of God, things that very much feel like they're coming from them and not from God. And then others of us who perhaps struggle more to ever want to think that God is speaking to us. So how do we know when it is the voice of God and not just our voice? And one of my friends in the room offered a wonderful piece of advice when we're trying to make that discernment. He said, we know that it's God when it is counterintuitive. We know that it's God when it is counterintuitive. When we see uh, so many examples in scripture of how people are hearing from God something that is not what they want to hear, but that they need to hear. When Jesus tells us that we should love our enemies, it is very counterintuitive, is it not? That we, in our own intuition, would like to vanquish our enemies and have revenge fantasies. So when Jesus says to love our enemies, we know that it is the voice of God that is speaking to us. There are, ver- there are two very distinct counterintuitive things that are happening in the text that we just read. The first one is related to worthiness, and the second one is related to leadership. So let me talk to you a little bit about Jesus' teaching that is very counterintuitive when it comes to worthiness. Has anybody here ever been to a foot washing service? Yes. Knowing that uh, you're getting your feet washed, there are certain feelings that come up, right? I've never led one or been a part of one where there wasn't active resistance in understanding that somebody else is going to wash my feet. There's something very counterintuitive about this teaching, right? We know that Jesus in this story, as he's at this meal, has decided to take it upon himself to go and to one by one wash his disciples' feet, taking on the form of the lowest form of servanthood that would have been part of their culture. Now, this isn't even part of our culture, so maybe that's what is getting uh, a little uncomfortable for us when we think about having our feet washed. But there's something else, isn't there? Which is that when we're peer-to-peer, we feel uncomfortable. That's something we could do ourselves. We can take care of ourselves. That should be something that we worry about and not let somebody else worry about. So imagine what it must have been like for these disciples who are with their most respected teacher, who are with the one that they viewed as their Messiah, the saving one, and all of a sudden he's down on his knees washing their feet. In that place we could think of what it must have been like for them to be humbled in this way, to have the one that they respected the most serving them, getting low. And so we're thankful for Peter's example, the rock. And when I think about the rock, actually we were singing the song, I have uh, the river of life flowing out of me. I think of that moment in Exodus where Moses is with the people of Israel and they're in the midst of the desert and they have nothing to drink and the people are thirsty and they're desperate. And so what does God do? He tells Moses to strike the rock. And out of that rock comes living water. And then we think about this name of Peter. This is one thing I felt like God affirmed in me that's true of the original Peter. Just this hard-headedness. This dryness. This seemingly ordinary rock, nothing extraordinary about it. The only thing that makes it what it is, is God's hand at work, striking the rock, and in so doing, streams of living water are able to flow. 
we get about this business, don't we, of trying to think that we can earn our own worthiness. I travel uh, outside of these doors and have conversations all the time with people who say, oh, I'd like to go to your church, but I really can't go there because I'll get struck by a lightning bolt because I'm so unworthy of going to church the way I've lived my life and my history and my background. See, that's intuitive for us. Intuitive for us is to think, man, I haven't done enough. I haven't been enough. My his- if you only knew my history, if you only knew the things that I struggled with, if you only knew what I didn't know that I should know as I should learn more or be more, then you would know that I'm really not qualified that I'm unworthy, especially if we think about Jesus coming to us to wash our feet. The early church father, Dionysus, once used the illustration of a tug of war, and he said there was a rope that uh, uh, somebody who was trying to get to God was pulling and pulling and pulling and pulling and pulling and pulling until eventually they realized that God was lifting them up to heaven. What's counterintuitive is that we don't get to determine our own worthiness. That God gives us his worthiness. That Jesus, in washing his disciples' feet, is showing the disciples that he can make them worthy. That he makes them qualified. That what makes them disciples is his work towards them. This is good news. This was good news. It's been good news all the way throughout the Bible, right? Because Peter was Mr. Impulsive, and now he's the rock, right? We think about David, who was a murderer and an adulterer, but is somehow called a man after God's own heart. Or Dave last week talked about faith and doubt, And Abraham is known as the father of our faith, and yet he had times where he was willing to lie because he struggled to believe that God would be faithful to him. And so God shows up in the places we least expect it, in the people we least expect it. Hudson Taylor, a British missionary to China, a really early innovator, wrote this. He said, all God's giants have been weak people. All God's giants have been weak people. In the, in the book of Hebrews, there is a beautiful text that's talking about how great some of the people of faith in our history that we stand in this lineage, and it has a unique line at the end. Hear this. I do not have the time for you to even know about Gideon or Barak or Samson or Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength. Whose weakness was turned to strength. I love that that phrase. So perhaps this morning you just for a moment want to wonder and ponder with God about your own worthiness and how, where it comes from. Eugene Peterson said this, all the persons of faith I know are sinners, doubters, uneven performers. We are secure not because we are sure of ourselves, because, but because we trust that God is sure of us. We spend so much time thinking, do I have enough faith? Do I have enough? Do I have enough? That we don't pause to think for a moment about God's belief in us. His radical trust in us. He made us. He loves us. He's calling us forward into his work declaring us worthy. And this is an important moment because we have to think, what is greatness? Maybe you want to imagine for a moment somebody who played a role in your life of servant, 
somebody who truly loved and served you, I pray that you have somebody like that in your life or had somebody like that in your life. When you think of that person, when I think of my mom, and you ask me, okay, because she served and served and served and served, do I think less of her? Or does that make me think that she was great? And yet, it's counterintuitive when we watch people serve, we somehow think that they're lesser. And yet, Jesus is here again to counterintuitively show us where greatness comes from. It comes from those who are able to get out of their own way and their own agenda, typically by being reduced in humility to an understanding that anything that comes from them is really just the gift of God. Right? And then God can get all the glory because he can see, (laughs) we can all see, it would not be possible if it wasn't for God. Like if it wasn't for God, Peter wouldn't be standing here. You wouldn't be in this church. You wouldn't be worshiping God. But because of how good God is and what God has done, he makes it possible for us to be his disciples. He makes it possible for us to allow for him to wash our feet, to serve us, to love us in the most intimate ways, And then to turn to us and say, you can do it too. You can be truly great. Do you want to be truly great? This is the example. Would you follow this example? And we'll do this over and over and over and over again throughout the eons so that people will understand that they are worthy of God's love. And we can show them that. That's all we have time for today. That's all I've brought. There are people downstairs right now that are currently doing this work. They're cooking a meal. They're preparing a table. And they do it week in and week out as an act of service, which is leadership. That they show up, not for themselves, but for those who are in need of a meal or clothing or just a love and a care of a kind smile, somebody who needs a prayer, and they lead by their example through their service. And now we get to all enjoy it as well. We get to sit at a table all together, and I invite you to this table as a servant leader to sit with somebody you don't know and discover the goodness of God in them and enjoy the servant leadership of those who are part of our church body and to do our best to simply receive a great meal and a great time together and give thanks for what God has done through our church. So please take that next step and go downstairs with us and enjoy a meal with us. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, you are good. And your goodness overflows, especially to those today who feel like they don't have a whole lot to offer. I pray that uh, they would be able to receive and know your love that they are worthy because you are worthy that they are loved because you love them and call them beloved that they are doing good things in the world and for the people around them because you have chosen them to do these good works, to be the hands and feet of of your church. We pray just for a blessed meal together as we extend our worship. We thank you so much for who you are, Lord Jesus. Precious and holy name we pray. Amen.
Will you stand and we'll sing one last song together?